So one of the things I want to talk about is, is this PVA relationship. And, and there's a couple ways to go about this. And what I want to spend a lot of time here is how you can do this graphically and qualitatively without having real hard data. Um, when we do this relationship and we do calculations, we're going to have um, some data and we know exactly how you go from position to velocity acceleration or more importantly from displacement to velocity so acceleration um, so there's a relationship here and we're going to talk about how to do this graphically um, but first what i want to do is just go ahead and do a quick review of the three components we're talking about remember position um, these are different depending on what textbook you're using or whatever you do these are abbreviations p d or s d, d is for distance um, s is for um, displacement type of things so what they use um, but remember, this is relative to a reference point. So you're at some location in space relative wherever your origin is. This is direction dependent, right? So there will be, this is the vector component of position being displacement. And you have many different units of measurement you can in, work with. Then you have the rate of change, rate change of position. And this is that velocity, and we'll use a little small v for this. And again, this is direction dependent. Um, and again, you have your unit of measurement here below. Um, and remember for the vector rate change of velocity, you have acceleration with a lowercase a. Um, and remember this one is direction independent um, with respect to the reference point is simply a change in velocity. Um, and that is where you're at. And again, with unit of time. So example here is meters per second per second or meters per second squared. Now the major portion of this lecture is going to be how we can graphically illustrate this relationship without having the quantity of data from a data collection. Um, and the way we do this is first you're going to learn how to identify um, motion from a position and, and relative concept. But then you're going to learn how to move from position to velocity acceleration using the slope. And we, we use tangential slope because there are multiple data points that we're going to incorporate and those are basically your time step points. Um, and the tangential slope is you're finding that line that crosses only that curve at that one particular point. And so that's what we're going to use tangential slope for. And, and just to reiterate, slope is going to be rise over run or your change in y, change of x. And what this illustrates is the steepness of that portion of the graph instantaneously. So at that particular region in the graph, what is your change in slope? And that is going to help us move in line down the line. Okay. And that tangential part is just that instantaneous slope where it only touches at that one point. So what this allows us to do to move from graph to graph is, is we're taking um, the derivative as we're moving from position to velocity acceleration. And that's the rate at which a value of the function changes with respect to another value. Um, and that's essentially what we're doing by taking that tangential slope. And then if we wanted to move the other way, and I'm not going to make you do that for this class, but I want you to be able to understand how we do this. Um, if I move from acceleration to velocity, or velocity to position, we're taking the integral. Um, and so we're integrating that area under the curve or summating that area under the curve by creating a bunch of trapezoids. And, and we can talk about that if you want. Um, and that brings us back up to the um, previous one. So if we're going from acceleration to velocity, velocity position. Um, so here's just a um, schematic illustration. If I start with position and I want to go to velocity, and if I go from velocity to acceleration, I take the slope of the line and more importantly, the tangential slope at each point that takes me to the next curve. If I want to go, and that's the derivative, if I want to go the other direction, I take the area under the curve, and that is included as the integral of the previous um, curve. Now, to make this a little easier for you, what we've done is we've identified a few critical events. Um, and so this makes transitioning from um, the graph's position to acceleration, or sorry, position to velocity acceleration, much more seamless and easy for you. And what each of these represents is actually the slope at that point. So we'll find something called inflection points, um, and then we'll find things called minim local, minimum, and maximums. 
and then we'll find portions that are zero. Um, and these are referring to the slopes of the line, and that helps us move to the next one. So an inflection point is really thought of, and, and what people talk about is the change in direction of the slope growth. Um, and this is where if you have a sinusoidal or a um, path, then you can talk about the concavity changes, um, but it's the tangential slope is at the greatest in this phase. And I'm gonna try to illustrate this a little bit for you. So if, and I'm gonna do the concavity portion. So if I have an upward portion and a downward portion of this, and say this is a portion of a sinusoid, um, at some point in this curvature here, the slope is gonna be the steepest or the greatest at the one point. And at some point it goes from being a concave up to a concave down. That point there, and we'll just mark it with an X here, is what we call an inflection point. And that's where this line goes from steep, getting steeper. So if we follow this line and we did the bunch of tangential, it's gradually getting steeper as I move this way to now changing and getting flatter or less steep going this way. And so that is essentially what the inflection point is. It's a change in the direction of which the slope is growing. So it's either getting steeper or it's getting more shallow. And when those change, it's an inflection point. Also the inflection point is when the slope is at its greatest, either in the positive or negative, and that's why it transfers into a minimum or a maximum in the following graph. So when we identify a min or a max, that is a local min or max where the tangential slope is zero. It's at its greatest or lowest for that section. To illustrate that, I'm just gonna draw a couple waves, okay? And so at this one, I can identify the local mins or maxes. So in this region, region A, there's a minimum. The slope here is zero, and that's my local minimum. Here, I have a local maximum. In B, a local minimum. In C, local maximum. In D, and so on. Right, so these are all locations where the slope is zero, it means there's in that small region, there's not a greater or minimum value for that variable. Now, because the slope is zero, you probably guessed it by now, that becomes a zero in the next graph, okay? And that zero is on the zero axis for that particular variable. So this means there's no rate of change. That means that whatever your uh, y-axis is, position, velocity, or acceleration, that means at that time point, there was no change in that variable. Okay, and so that's very important to understand is that it crosses the axis in the next graph from a min-max to a zero. So the next phase is as how we are going to set these up. Um, there is a step process that I would like you to go through. And if you can do this process, you're gonna get this right all the time. Um, and so the most important aspect of this is how we set up our graphs. Um, essentially, I'll, I'll do a little illustration, but you'll see it more on the next slide. But it's essentially, you're gonna set them up in a vertical alignment. So I put one long axis on, and that's all my Y axes. And then we have individual um, X axes, and these are always typically time and whatever your measurement of time is. These are all times and seconds. And then you have your position, your velocity, and your acceleration, individual constraints, right? So what I need you to do is, is position is typically always on top, followed by velocity, followed by acceleration, and you need to label your axes. I already have my time labeled. And then what does the origin identify? That is something that is very important for you to understand is what does this origin mean for each of these components, okay? But let's go forward. So this is what it would look like if I had went ahead and did it perfectly. And I would, if you do this um, drawing, you should always use a ruler. Um, and if, I, if you do this on um, a computer or anything, always use the line components because it's easier. But if you can see, I have my position up here, my velocity, and my acceleration. 
What I haven't done yet is label my axis. So I'm going to label this time in seconds, time in seconds, all the way down. Okay. Now over here, we're going to say, let's do our position graph is in meters. So that means our velocity graph is meters per second and our acceleration is meters per second squared. Okay. So now if I'm setting this up, I have the graphic interpretation of what I need. I have my position, velocity, acceleration. What you understand is that some point in here, you change from position to acceleration, same with, or sorry, velocity in here, it's separation of the velocity acceleration. Some people like to separate these. I just keep it all in together and because I'm not putting any values over here. What you don't see is values on this or values um, on the X axis. So you're not gonna see those so just be careful um, so you understand what's happening, okay? So the next step that we want to do is you begin with the know. What information do you know? What knowledge do you have about the task? And what separates into sections if possible? So kind of conversations you have is running. Um, you're going to have portions of running where you have a foot in contact with the ground. Then you have aerial phase. You have components of... If I'm doing an elbow flexion task where I'm doing bicep curls, I have a full extension, I go up, there's decreasing flexion in, on, or increasing elbow flexion, and then you go back down and, and uh, decrease elbow flexion and increase extension. So those are components that you need to know. Now separating it into sections also would be like if I was doing a counter movement jump, there's a portion where I'm gonna take my center mass, go towards the ground, then I stop at the bottom and I turn back up and I jump up towards the top and then I come back and fall to the ground. Each one of those you'll see broken up into a next, into a different component. So when you break the graph into sections, you use vertical lines and these are connecting your critical events between graphs. This is a portion that's going to be essential for your success in PBA relationships. If you can learn how to connect the dots and the vertical lines and do it in a manner that's sequential and easy to follow, you're going to get full points and, and be very successful in this process. So let's do a, a little example here of, of how to identify these critical points, because what's going to happen is when you do position and velocity, you need to identify the points of critical events. That way it allows you to draw them down the line to the next components. And what that looks like is this. If I go through there, there's many different mins and maxes. And I'm going to give you a second to see if you can identify how many critical events there are. First of all, give me the inflection points. How many inflection points can you see? So these are all inflection points right now. And I would lay them X's or, or dots, if, however you want to do it. And then you put IP by it because I want to make sure that you know what the IP is and what it is. Okay. There's a couple ways you can do it. I'm using red here. Now, just because I know this is a sinusoidal path, um, I know I can mark an X here. And I know I can mark an IP there because I know what this is. This is a very cyclical process uh, of a running center of mass motion that we're, that I'm pretty used to. So, um, but if you didn't do that, then I wouldn't necessarily mark it wrong. I would just have to make sure that you are going to finish it over on the edges. So then we also mark our max and mins. These are all I have identified my maxes and we're going to do our mins here. Now, what we don't know is whether these are mins or maxes because we don't know where it's going to go. So I don't mark those as mins or maxes. Um, but what you can do is identify these as maxes all the way through and make sure you label it. And now again, and I don't, I don't care if you label um, just an M for mins and maxes as long as you can transfer it properly to the next um, graph. So if you just want to do M for a min or max, you're more than welcome to do that. Now for this graph, um, position center mass, we have, we, there are no zeros. Um, and because a zero would be something that is simply crossing this X axis uh, or, the, or the axis at zero in, of the position and we don't have anything there, which makes sense because this person doesn't fall through the ground. Um, so you have identified all of your components. Um, and then the next step is gonna be uh, essential 
to your success and that is going to be creating these lines that take you down and I'm going to try to do this here if I can and you do these dotted lines all the way down and it'll help you draw that connect so each of the ones you do a dotted line down so at this point with the position you've identified your investment points in your mins and maxes and you're ready to go forward one of the questions I asked previously and, and I told you to really focus on is is trying to understand what the origin of your graph represents and and this is really essential when you set up your PVA relationship and how you're trying to um, illustrate what is happening in the physical task to begin your PVA relationship and set up your position graph um, and so what I want to do real quick is just kind of illustrate how your position graph and what your origin represents is is, is important and in, in a essential function of a proper position velocity acceleration so if we take this position graph and i'll go ahead and label them peter position in meters and we'll have our time in seconds over here um, what does this intersection actually represent and this is where the importance comes because that's going to tell you what this line coming out means and whether or not my position goes below or not and now from a linear perspective a lot of times what we're going to use is the center of mass of the object or the motion um, to represent the, that position and so this graph can mean three couple of different things if i was doing a squat uh, on the ground then that origin may be the um, ground if i was a swimmer and i was diving you know, or or if i was a diver diving into a pool or a swimmer and i was jumping off the blocks to do my swim then the origin may be the water surface so therefore, as I enter the pool, I would be fall into this area down here. Whereas if I was doing a squat, I would always be up here. Um, or if I, you know, a diving situation, I start, come up, go down below, and then maybe come back up if I was coming out of the water again. So this is why understanding where your origin, what it represents is, is going to be a key component to you going forward and being able to illustrate properly what's happening okay because remember that this origin means that whatever your position is that is zero at time whatever you're at so if i cross this i cross the zero if i was doing a shuttle run this zero may be the start line so i would not cross that but i would approach it until i finished right um, and so that's one of the key components that i want you to understand and as we're moving forward um, your success is very um, dependent upon your ability to illustrate this properly. So these are a couple examples that I have for you. So if I was doing this one, whatever this means is this person was doing whatever they had in the negative quadrant. They started closer to the origin, moved further away from the origin, and then moved back closer, but never touched the origin, right? Where this person started their activity or whatever it was and the positive direction of the origin moved towards the origin cross the origin turned around came back cross the origin getting back into the positive i would illustrate this one as the entire thing was in the positive um, quadrant of the from the origin this individual started further away from the origin moved towards the origin never touching the origin and then moved back further away for each of these components, I would go through and I would identify these as the minimums, these all as inflection points, as well as these as inflection points. So if I move to the velocity graph, each one of these would all be done in the same way. I have minimums, zeros, and maximums in the next graph. So this portion of it would look something like this. And they would all have that same trajectory, and the same look in the next graph, okay? So this is what it is in the position graph and how your origin really determines what you should be doing. So just to review the PBA relationship, um, when we're going from position to velocity acceleration, we're deriving the graph based on the slope of the line, the tangential slope. If we're going the other direction from acceleration to velocity to position, we're going to take the integral of the area under the curve, uh, the summation of the area under the curve, and we align our graphs vertically and draw the lines to connect down. 
Um, that is the IPs turn into min maxes of the next, and min maxes turn into zero because a very intricate component is that is what the slope of the lines are telling us. IPs identify the greatest or the, the steepest slope, and the polarity, whether it's a positive or negative slope, tells us whether it becomes a minimum or a maximum. Negatives become mins and maxes, positives become maxes. So there we, there we go, um, and that's going to be how you're designed to set up. And again, min or max of the slopes are zero, so it becomes a zero in the next graph. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post an example of how I would run through these um, and give you an example of that um, in a step-by-step -step, um, PowerPoint slide of some illustrations or pictures. I'm going to draw it out and do it that way.